Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burrus. Joining us today is Grant Babcock. He's the associate editor of libertarianism.org. Hello. Today we're going to talk about natural rights and then specifically how they relate to radical libertarianism. What are natural rights? Well, so two parts, right? There's the rights part and the natural part. So let's start with the rights part. Uh, a right basically is there are certain things which other people can't do to you and you can't do to other people by virtue of uh, your possessing moral agency and personhood, right? So if we think uh, that uh, it's wrong for me to reach across the table and s stab Trevor in the chest with my pen and that the reason that's wrong is because it's uh, – disrespectful to Trevor's dignity as a moral agent, right? Because there are things that I could reach across and stab with my pen, like a stuffed animal or a maybe a fish, depending. Both of those would be of pretty fish. creepy to do, though. Right. Or if a yeah. fish was at the table, that'd be. But yeah. or, or if you just stabbed <laughs> a stuffed animal, here, that would be pretty pretty strange. But continue. Right. Uh, and and we and we think that 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 would be wrong. Like by, again, by virtue of uh, something about Trevor, uh, you know, and that he's a the, he's a moral agent. That he's a that he's a, a person. And I use person in the uh, ethical sense, right, of of the word person. So then, what what makes a right a natural right? Well, that would be uh, probably the easiest way to describe it would be to contrast it with something like a civil right. So. A civil right would be something like uh, the right to vote. It only makes sense to talk about the right to vote in the context of uh, a democracy where we have uh, privileges, you know, that are are contingent on uh, that particular political system. And them setting up polling places, balloting places. Right, right. And there's a lot uh, or, of things that are required right. for voting, or a right to trial by jury, for example, and. Uh, a natural right, in, in contrast, is uh, it's a pre-political uh, type of right. So it's the sort of thing where even if there uh, were no polling places, even if the the halls of Congress were empty, uh, it would still be wrong for me to uh, steal Trevor's coffee mug. Uh, but, and, but the voting would be irrelevant, right? Is it? Yeah. So it's it's pre-political, but it's also just to clarify post-political in the sense that these these rights exist before government and would exist without government, but the argument is they also continue to exist even if there is a government. Correct. Uh, the one wrinkle with that is that sometimes uh, social contract theorists will talk about us bargaining away certain natural rights in a social contract. Uh, so like uh, I might have a right to uh, – basically be a vigilante, right? So if I think I've been injured by Trevor, uh, I have the right to avenge myself upon him or to, you know, if he st stole my coffee mug, I could go and take it back myself. Uh, whereas some uh, some uh, some social contracts theorists would say when you enter into political society, uh, you give up that that natural right and in, ex in, in exchange you get the uh, the political right to you know be part of the justice system. Now, but either one of those, we could, we could talk and we have talked on free thoughts before about whether social contract theory is legitimate or all those things. Yeah. But you, if you're in a social contract system, as America theoretically is at least, yeah. um, or in in a, an, a state of anarchy that yeah. respects rights all the time and have not been bargained away. But in both those, we're still talking about some sort of rights-based theory of either government legitimacy or maybe non-legitimacy of government, both based in rights, correct? Correct, yeah. And that means – and that, of course, is our tradition. And it also seems to me that there aren't many people – and you know the literature better than I do – but who just – don't think rights exist. Oh, well, there's plenty of people like that, right? So uh, anyone who is a utilitarian, right? I mean, yeah, if yeah. you're like a strict utilitarian, but yeah. those are pretty rare. Well, Maybe not in the flaw in the academy. Right. So th that's the thing is I, I'm definitely thinking in terms of the academy because if we're talking about uh, the moral sense that uh, your average human being on the street has, that's really – it's not systematized or formalized in any way. So it, it wouldn't really make sense to say uh, – this guy, you know, believes in rights and consistently, and this guy doesn't. Right? It's more of it's going to be a hodgepodge. Do these rights 
so the ones that you described are you can't do certain things to Trevor. And I wonder just how many times, and this is yeah. going to be episode 202, there's been hypothetical violence directed at Trevor. It I seems, it seems to go that way more than he, any he's other just, he, He's just more punchable. Than yes, I, I guess. Uh, I have the but, Ted Cruz punchable face. Yes. <laughs> uh, but so you, it's a – these rights are – Trevor has rights yeah. by nature of his humanity mm. um, that are then act as prohibitions, limits on what you're allowed to do. Right. So in so, Nozick's term, they're side constraints. Right. Um, so the so, idea – let's go on side constraints for a minute. So the, the idea is that I have a sort of sphere of in, independent action wherein I get to make decisions about how things go, right? And that – well, where's the border to that? Well, the border to that is uh, there are things outside uh, my legitimate realm of control, right? So, uh, is that is that your your rights? Is that what you're saying? Right. So, and and uh, like my right to swing my fist ends at your face. Yeah. See, I that's almost a little question beggy, right? Uh, so, like, well, let's let's go back to me stabbing you. Right. Please, so let's do. It. Yeah. Aaron's so smiling over there. Can't come up enough. Yes. <laughs> so I, so let's say I, I have a kitchen knife. Right. There are lots of things that I get to do with that kitchen knife. Right. I get to you know prepare a steak with it. I can sharpen it. I can destroy it. Melt it down. All these things. Right. I get to decide what happens about it. The reason that uh, I I can't you know decide that what happens to the knife is that it goes into your chest is because now I'm not making decisions just about the knife anymore. Right. It's I, I'm also making decisions about your chest and its structural cohesion. Does this then mean that natural rights are always and only negative rights, as it's called? So they're they're prohibitions on what you can do to other people or other people. You know, it's my rights are things that people may not do to me, as opposed to positive rights. Um, which are more like I have an expectation that things – I will receive certain things or right. things will be done for me. Like there, there has to be some economic production, which is then uh, – so it sort of depends on what part of the natural rights tradition you're, you're talking about, right? And it also depends on if you're talking about uh, whether it, it is an enforceable thing or not. So uh, – you could argue and, and libertarians have argued that uh, children have a right to uh, food and shelter from their parents or guardians, right? And that would be an example of a, a right that they have you know, by virtue of being what they are that is pre-political but it's probably a positive right. Uh, the main line of like the liberal tradition, like going back into the Enlightenment and continuing down to you know us three sitting around the table right now, tends to think that at least when it comes to adults, uh, we're talking about uh, negative rights as being the the ones relevant to political questions of uh, enforceability. And libertarians are are often associated with with rights theory. I think if anyone has a kind of popular conception of libertarianism, it has to do with these very strong assertions of rights. Uh, is that the, the right conception of libertarianism in your view? In my view, yes. I think that, that the rights conception is the correct one, but it's, it's not the only uh, way libertarians think about ethics. Here's where we can plug. Grant and I are the co-editors of Arguments for Liberty, which you can download for free at libertarianism.org, which presents nine different arguments, only one of which is grounded in a strict natural rights conception. Yeah, maybe two, depending on how you how you can count can't Kant. Ah, <laughs> count <laughs> count Kant. Is that what we just said? I yes. tried to. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, what sort of questions, uh, in in this sense, getting into the heart of, of your essay, um, if you have a robust respect for rights, uh, it gets you to a properly liberal order is in, in your conception, and it's it's it, they're fairly absolutist. Would would that be correct the way you view it? Right. I think that this this idea of absolutism is sort of baked into the idea of a right. It's a, it's a bright line. It's a line in the sand. It's a this far, no further kind of way of thinking about morality. Um, so that gets in sort of directly to the question of uh, does that imply radicalism? What do you mean by radicalism? So what is radical yeah. libertarianism? Right. I mean, I wish someone would tell me in some sense, but we can we can try. Uh, 
the word radical is thrown thrown around a lot of different ways. In 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 some uh, uses, it's just a pejorative, right? It's uh, it means unserious and sort of uh, immature and concerned with extremism for its own sake. Uh, I think that's nibbling around the edges of something that's almost correct, right? Which is that uh, when we radicalism is a relative thing, it's relative to some some kind of uh, center, which uh, is in this context, it would be like the status quo, right? So like, how different are my views about how the political order should be compared to how it is? And the bigger that gap is, the more the more radical I am. And that, so you're okay. That's why you're okay with being called a radical in this regard, right? Yeah. Because because I'm an anarchist, as mm-hmm. you know, you you both know, and uh, I guess the audience now does. If they did so it is is radicalism then synonymous with anarchism or radical libertarianism, or can you be a radical libertarian or I guess a natural rights libertarian without taking that all the way to? The abolition of the state. So I think there is a distinction to be made here, and I'm going to draw on an essay by Murray Rothbard called "Do You Hate the State?" And he says, uh, when he, he says radical, right? He means radical in the sense of being in total root and branch opposition to the existing political system and to the state itself. Radical in the sense of having integrated intellectual opposition to the state with a gut hatred of its pervasive and organized system of crime and injustice. Radical in the sense of a deep commitment to the spirit of liberty in any statism that integrates reason and emotion, heart and soul. And then he goes on and he gives uh, examples of anarchists who he thinks are not radical and uh, minimal state type libertarians who he thinks are radical. So the his his sort of paradigm case for a anarchist libertarian who he doesn't think is radical is uh, David Friedman, who wrote the, the Machinery of Freedom around the same time as his book For a New Liberty came out. And David Friedman's book is all about the utilitarian case for libertarian anarch- anarchism, like the idea that you know life will be better and more enjoyable, and we'll all be wealthier and happier if we get rid of the state. Uh, now, in that book, uh, Friedman takes care to say, uh, "Look, I'm not dismissing rights out of hand, but I think that if you know, rhetorically speaking, we're trying to co- convince somebody that it makes sense to make consequentialist, utilitarian type arguments." Rothbard doesn't necessarily think he's super serious about that, but that might be a fault of Rothbard rather than Friedman. So, who would be a radical, minimal, min- minarchist or yeah. minimal state? Well, he, he gives a great list, actually. Right? He says uh, our classical liberal forebears who were genuinely radical, who hated statism in the states of their day with a beautifully integrated passion: the Levellers, Patrick Henry, Tom Paine, Joseph Priestley, the Jacksonians, Richard Cobden, and on and on. Right? And he says, Tom Paine's radical hatred of the state and statism was and is far more important to the cause of liberty than the fact that he never crossed the divide between laissez-faire and anarchism. So, when, so that gets us – I'm trying to parse this out in my head that we're talking about absolutism and rights and you sort of – you said they're inherently absolutist. And one of the things – one of the you think you wrote this essay in response to an essay by our, our former colleague, Brink Lindsay, uh, who was criticizing natural rights theory. And the main source of his criticism was basically the absolutism of these rights claiming to – like either A, going too far because of uh, the perception of that or they're just going too far or and B, because they don't – the absolutism of the rights doesn't solve many questions. But so if we're going to say these, idea, these rights are absolute, we have these questions about – that always come up and we've talked about. I think 190 episodes ago with Matt Zwolinski, or we talked about shining laser pointers on your house and in pollution and minor little, you know, touching you for a second. And or going back to the knife and Trevor example, because or, again, or that too, yes. um, yeah. like if he's unconscious and you know he's choking and you need to cut a hole in his throat right, to right. So, so on one level, you, could, you know, libertarians will say what many people think are "quote unquote" crazy things by just saying yes. If you shine yeah. a laser pointer on my door, you are violating my rights. Rights are absolute. Yeah. Uh, so, how do you respond to those kind of well, characterizations? It, this is sort of hard to talk about generally. So, I'll, I'll try to get more concrete with the the laser pointer, right? Like. Yeah, if you're shining a laser pointer on my house and I want you to stop doing that, I should be able to ask you to stop doing that and you should comply, right? Uh, but does that – so is that 
I guess going to that, so it, does it limit your ability to retaliate, or do you have to? Do you have? Does do rights theory itself tell you how you can react to someone's violations of your rights, or do you need something else? Right. Okay. I see where you're going with this now. Uh, basically, all all rights tell you is is where the line is. It doesn't necessarily tell you what an appropriate response is, right? You, you, could, you could say, I believe absolutely in natural rights, but then also have some kind of theory of proportionality, right? Now, Rothbard famously is not really big on this. And uh, actually, I think Locke isn't either, right? He says if someone is trespassing, then that means that, well, they might, you know, if they're willing to do that, then as far as you know, they're willing to kill you, so you can kill them right back. Uh, but I this... I mean, to put this another way, um, there's the argument that you know if we took these, if if rights are absolute, and so to take your laser pointer example, like um, so, someone shining it on your house, it's you know at best at, or at most a vanishingly small harm to your property, but you can tell them not to, and they should comply. Um, that gets us into was it. Was it Zolinsky who wrote the essay on pollution? Pollution, and yeah, that, that we could shut down yeah, industry. Yeah, that if, if we took that seriously and took it to its natural conclusions, we wouldn't be allowed to have industry. Which Brink We wouldn't be allowed to drive cars. We wouldn't yeah. be allowed to do anything because the pollution or the noise or whatever else would be infringing on people's rights, which would seem to you know, cast us into pretty impoverished lives. Um, so is that is that is getting out of that? Do you bite the bullet on that and say yes? Well, if we we're going to just respect everyone's rights, we would have to live as hermits. Um, or do you say, well, the rights those aren't really rights violations? Like the the rights are more flexible than that. Or do you say those are such de minimis harms that we just it's it's like unreasonable to not put up with them. Like, yes, I'm violating your rights, but it's so small that if you get mad and try to stop me, you're overreacting. A few things. So Rothbard famously says, like, no, like smokestacks are aggression. You know, polluting rivers with your your industrial runoff is aggression, and that you know the people who then are are harmed by you know breathing bad air and drinking bad water have cause of action uh, against you. Right? He thinks in a in a Sort of, there's some path dependency here, right? Where uh, we live in a world where the state has basically issued out all these permits saying uh, you're allowed to emit this much, you know, toxic stuff, and you're allowed to emit this much toxic stuff, and other people can't, right? And then we've built up this industrial society on that basis. But he's 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 imagining a sort of a different path where the law took a different tack on that and said, you know, pretty strongly no, right? So many of these questions of, of uh, practicality, right, sort of boil down to: I can't imagine a business model that successfully does X. Uh, therefore, X is impossible. Therefore, your demand uh, for you know radical libertarianism is is kaput. Uh, I'm sort of uncompelled by that sort of thing, and part of it is I very seldom see a good faith attempt to even try to think of how it might work. Uh, a great example of this is uh, when Ludwig von Mises is, is writing, uh, I think it's in one of the later editions to Human Action that came out after Rothbard had sort of started talking about anarchism. Uh, uh, Mises is talking about how, well, you know, capitalism and uh, freedom and all these things are contingent upon sort of a, a society that has the rule of law and all these things. So therefore, to talk about the market producing uh, legal services like courts and police and that sort of thing is a category error. And you know the whole the whole anarchist project is just doesn't get off the ground. I think that's f sort of fairly obviously just a failure of imagination, right? About and and a very like excessively narrow uh, view of like what markets are and uh, the applicability of even even Mises's own thinking about human action, right? So getting getting into some of the criticisms that Brink has. Made about the natural rights theory, but one of them is is that the need more than rights, and we kind of touched on it, and, and so maybe I already know your answer, but we can get back into it, which is we need more than rights to answer some questions. 
that the legal system answers without rights. And if libertarians are going to sort of say, no, no, rights sort of solve the problems of the world, what he sort of says, yeah. we don't need politics, then we're ignoring all these basic facts. So yes, you have a right to property and you can homestead it, but how high above your property do you own and your right, right doesn't answer it? Or how, how do you abandon your property? How long do you have to let it go until you abandon it? Or like sort of in an adverse possession sense, all these questions are not answered by rights. So therefore, it seems that rights don't get us too far. It, or there's a lot of play in the joints, and it could be a it could be a rights respecting world, generally, but also not very libertarian. Right. I th I think that's sort of confused on several levels. the The first is it's mischaracterizing like what's what the work that rights are doing uh, when you're thinking about a, a libertarian or even even not even a non libertarian political order. Right. Like these are side constraints. It doesn't like it doesn't tell us anything about you know, what we do inside the edge of, of the canvas, right? And indeed, there will be you know, like multiple possibilities that are uh, compatible with uh, rights thinking. Uh, one of my favorite things, Trevor, that we've talked about in the past is uh, sort of the rituals and signifiers that we that different societies have used to determine what counts as a transfer of property where like way way back in medieval England if uh, I wanted to buy Aaron's acre of land we actually both had to go out there Aaron had to pick up some dirt off the ground and put it in my hand and only delivery of season right yes. only only then was the was the deal sealed right um, this is one of the the few concepts actually where I uh, I, I think Hans Hoppe's uh, characterization is is interesting and helpful where he talks about the uh, intersubjectively determinable boundaries right which are sort of necessarily going to be uh, socially contingent right there's nothing there's nothing eternal about going to a land and handing dirt to each other right there could be other like sufficient. Uh, ways of cashing out what what a uh, property system and land looks like, uh, and then there are questions that which don't really have anything to do with uh, rights at all, like uh, which side of the road should everyone drive on? Right, Hayek, Hayek talks about this sort of thing a lot when he talks about the law. About uh, there needs to be a uniform convention, but it doesn't really matter what, much one way or the other uh, what it's about. And like in that case, rights aren't going to Drill down, nor 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 are they trying to. So so does that mean that we're we're okay with these legal? So in, in, we talk about again, I say adverse possession or uh, regulations that infringe upon your property of certain like. So you can't build buildings super high to obstruct airplanes or think, you know you or you don't own all the way to the sky or you would own airplanes as they flew over your house these all seem absurd but if you took rights theory to the extreme maybe that's the case and if we're going to give a concession to well you know socially ordering helps and it, and it matters in the situation so therefore we can concede that we're going to work in politics to some degree insofar as we're negotiating the terms of what the limits of these rights are as long as we're still keeping honest about protecting the rights themselves that we can right. play so in this, the joints? This, this politics thing, right, seem, seems to me it, it's trying to aim at characterizing anyone who says like rights are a serious thing we need to consider. It's trying to say that uh, thereby they're like dodging the hard work of cashing out all these details and which are important, right, uh, to have a functioning society. Uh, that strikes me as sort of silly. There's nothing to do with rights or radicalism that is apolitical in that like the fact that I think that there is a right or a wrong answer to a certain question or even multiple right and multiple wrong answers to a certain question, nothing about that lets me escape politics, right? I still, I still have to do the work of persuasion and uh, the work of uh, – bargaining, if you like, right? I think there's also in that critique, there's an equivocation on the definition of politics. Yeah. Because what – so in those those questions that need to be answered, that rights can't answer, that we have to do the rough and tumble of persuasion and compromise and all of that, those would be present even in an anarchist society, right? In a society like because it's a society and when you're in a society, you have to interact with your fellow human beings and you have to figure out how to live together and how to live in beneficial ways. Um, and so if 
politics simply is. It seems like when, you know, when the critique is, well, this natural rights thing is like a, you know, an unjustified rejection of politics, like you think you can escape it. Well, no, if that's what we mean by politics, which is simply kind of social persuasion and social interaction and living together in a society, then that politics is very much a part of a strict natural rights and even anarchist society. Right. But the equivocation comes in sliding over to politics necessarily means politics of the state. Right. It means you know solving like not just the act of trying to figure those questions out, but the act of figuring those questions out via the mechanisms of government as an enforcement tool, as a system of institutions. Um, and it seems to me, and so the the thought is like there's almost a false dilemma I think that's being articulated, which is look if you you know if you say you're rejecting politics then really what you're doing is rejecting – you're rejecting the whole thing. So if I say, no, I'm realistic and think we need to have politics, that means necessarily we need the institutions of a liberal order, the state, the coercive force of laws right. and all of that. Right. And so to say – and so we can say like, look, it would be unreasonable to reject politics. And so then therefore if you reject government politics, you're being unreasonable, whereas you can simply instead say, no, what I'm doing is rejecting the necessity of these particular institutions as an enforcement mechanism for the political and instead I'm going to embrace the political as a different non-governmental system. It reminds me of, of the cattle farmers of Shasta County, California, as one is usually reminded in times like these. Uh, this is a book by Robert Ellickson uh, called Order Without Law where he analyzes the way cattle farming is done in this relatively rural part of California where essentially they, they've come up with a bunch of rules that are trying to deal with the kind of questions, the practical, so to speak, questions we're talking about, about cattle and when they go out, they, they let them into the field in the mountains when they're during the winter and then they bring them back in and sometimes they trample on other people's property and sometimes they they die or like or there's a conflict of different sorts and they've developed a bunch of of rules that you could call political they've done it through just long-term social interaction and, and eventually they were ignoring the laws of California that California told them, no, these are actually the laws about who has the loss and who, who is going to have to pay in these situations. They just ignored them and used their own rules. In that situation, I think it goes to what Aaron was saying, is that they didn't they figured out these inherently difficult questions. They figured out solutions, at least workable for right now, solutions to these questions through methods that are not just endorsing the political uh, in the way that you described it. Right. The the other book I I'd, I'd want to point out here is uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work about uh, governing the commons is the title, and it's about governing the commons. Right. How do uh, communities uh, solve uh, tragedy of the common style problems without recourse to a monopoly uh, like punishing state? So if we're getting into what what a lot of the criticisms here that I think Brink was was putting on natural rights libertarianism, and of course Brink has been on the show before, and he's always welcome back. But the uh, the, the criticisms, a lot of them are about strategy, which is something we talk about on the show a lot anyway. Uh, whether or not we're going, it's best to you know proceed from a radical standpoint or to work in the halls of government. It's something libertarians talk about all the time. But one of the things that, that Brink argues is that you know from a standpoint of the way the politics is in this country. And that we're broadly liberal, uh, and that if we're not participating in that discussion, and that we're saying we have all these solutions that we don't even need to get involved in those politics, uh, then it's not going to be strategically good for libertarians to stay out of those and just and to say that things that people really like and really care about, possibly uh, such as the welfare state um, and regulations on safety and health and things like this, that they're just not acceptable and we won't come and talk to you. We won't come and, t and talk to your political people or, or try to persuade it until you just get rid of that entire thing, the welfare state or whatever, that that's just absolutely unreasonable and a, a good way to guarantee the libertarians won't ever positively affect anything. Well, so there, there's two things going on there, right? One is that uh, – I like. I think that Brink thinks that the welfare state is like probably a good idea, at least within certain limits, right? And or cashed out in a certain way. Uh, and then the second question is, uh, 
Well, suppose then that the libertarian position is that the welfare state's bad, which I, I think the welfare state's bad and we shouldn't have one. I mean, we shouldn't have the rest of the state either, but the, that's a discussion for later. Uh, it strikes me as odd to say that, uh, well, we can make progress on this thing if we just uh, pretend that you know we agree with them on all this other stuff, right? And that uh, talking about the welfare state being bad is preventing us from you know whatever the laundry list of things it is, like criminal justice reform or uh, the the tax code or any of these other issues, right? Uh, I don't think politics really works that way, where. Uh, you know, I mean, I guess someone could have a view that's like so repugnant, like they're a, like a white supremacist or something, that they become sort of radioactive and you can't work with them on anything. Uh, but my feeling is, if you if you want to be respected in serious conversations about politics, that look, you you just say like this is what I believe and this is like the strongest good faith argument I can make for that, right? And that doesn't mean you can't then make comparative statements. Right, you you know, I could say, uh, look, I don't think the government should be involved in education at all, but uh, a voucher system might be better than uh, universal public schooling. Right now, Murray Rothbard famously <laughs> thought the opposite. Right, he thought that uh, vouchers were a step away from the libertarian ideal because you had this functioning private system that was doing things outside the state without very much state oversight or intervention, and that by letting the vouchers in, you're letting in state money and therefore state control, right? And you're, you're basically co-opting the, the private schools into, into the public ones. Uh, That's a strategy discussion, though. Right, right. And well, and it's, and it's also, it, it goes to show that you can, even if you're, you're both radicals, you might disagree about incremental steps, right? Or like whether whether a step is in the right direction and whether it's uh, whether it's good or bad, uh, you know whether it's a small step or a big step. I think there's also another. I mean, another false dilemma happening here, and another interesting thing happening in this argument that that because because moderation is maybe more effective in getting policy stuff done in Washington, whether it's you know easier to get your foot in the door if you are behaving in a moderate fashion or – Maybe moderate are, relatively. Right? Moderate relatively. Yeah. And I, I uh, take issue even with that premise actually, but right? Let's, let's just yeah. you know, just accept for the sake of argument yeah. that you know, if, you, if you are espousing really radical absolute positions you're not going to be listened to yeah. let's just well, say see, but that's uh, getting that's getting the causation backwards right no no but let me let me just okay. cuz i think we'll just we'll bracket that issue cuz i think that okay. there's something else going on here which is so the the move though that seems to be going on is to say because it is so we could say like look you should you can be like rat, natural rights radicalism might be right correct the truth in terms of the way that we should look morally at um, our interactions with other people and with the government, um, but to always rhetorically go to it might be a failure, and so therefore we should moderate our tone um, and moderate what we're saying in order to advance in that direction. That's an argument, um, but which is but it what, seems to what be, I believe. But it seems like there's a there's a there's another version of the argument that then takes it like retroactively to say, and because of that, natural rights itself must be wrong. Like that because moderation is tactically better, the underlying motive of natural rights can't be like it's ontologically incorrect. And that doesn't um, follow from – Right. And I think that that's – I think that where that gets us um, is you can run into a serious problem where – so to analogize this to say the abolition debate, OK? So you might make an argument that – so you could say – Slavery is absolutely wrong. It's about as repugnant and immoral an act as anyone can engage in. Um, there's, you know, there, this is a bright line. There's no nuance here. Like end of story. But if we are going to end widespread slavery, um, simply taking up arms and killing slave owners might not do it as quickly and effectively as, say, operating at the legislative level and trying to persuade the slave owner, like. 
Right, well, slave owning, not, you know, not to conflate radicalism with advocating violence. Also. Sure, yeah. but but so so you might say like that's a more effective way to get it done faster and safer. Okay, um, but and so therefore you should temper your rhetoric slightly when trying to advance this cause. Yeah. Aaron, but, Aaron, but Aaron put problem, scare quotes around that because yes. by temper his rhetoric he means hide the ball. But but right? the problem I think is when you then like well, I think what's going on here on his natural rights argument. Um, is saying then something along the lines of not only that what that actually means is that being an absolutist on the issue of slavery itself is wrong, that you know you should take a moderate position on slavery and on the rightness or wrongness of slavery um, in order to have your rhetoric match your principles. Yeah. But that seems to me like there's no reason to betray your principles simply because you think a different style of rhetoric is going to be more effective. Well, let's, let's think about it this way for a minute. Suppose that uh, every libertarian who is more radical than Gary Johnson uh, stops saying anything more or advocating anything more radical than Gary Johnson. What, what is the effect of this? The effect of this is that Gary Johnson is now the most radical libertarian, right? Do you think that's a, that would be bad for yeah. libertarianism? I mean, I I think so, and I think it would be tactically bad, right? Because, uh, you know, as much as I get upset when more moderate libertarians point to the radical libertarians and say, "Look, look, I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I'm not I may that be, guy. I'm not that guy. I'm, I may be a little nuts, but I'm not Grant Babcock, right?" Uh, <laughs> So I, I may have done that before. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this idea that we need, we need to you know the, the radicals should just be quiet, right? And then everything, all the all of a sudden the you know the gates of power will open up to Gary Johnson and he'll be able to uh, you know legalize weed and whatever other incremental gain it is, right? Uh, I think I think that's sort of wrongheaded. Like the, it's not that. You know the the radicals being there is preventing that, right? So it's true, though, that yeah, like like the the U.S. political system is set up where decisions are made like at by moderates at the margin, right? But that doesn't mean that becoming more moderate and and closer to the margin makes you more influential, right? Like. We, if we want to move, you know, where the, where the median voter is, right? You don't do that by moving yourself closer to the existing median because the median has changed, right? It's it's a it's it's a, I mean, it, it also seems know. somewhat implausible that to say like the reason that Gary Johnson's policies say um, are not accepted by the American public or by law, by lawmakers is because there are people more radical than Gary Johnson. Um, I mean that seems like an odd argument when in fact the reason that Gary Johnson's policies are not more popular among American voters and lawmakers is because American voters and lawmakers are not fans of Gary Johnson's policies. Right. No, no one says, for example, that like Hillary Clinton is unelectable because the Socialist Workers Party exists. And that's an interesting point because the, the radicalism – the, the libertarians get accused of is something that often irks me, because you know we're the kind of people if you go on a TV show and you're you're advocating a principle. And we we talked about this. Uh, I think it's in the Jamie White episode, the the politics in New Zealand episode. Although it might have been conversations outside of that episode, so I apologize if you went to. But we discussed this. Uh, he was talking about uh, consensual sexual relationships, like advocating consensual sexual relationships among adults in New Zealand and he goes on TV and the first thing the person asks him is incest defend it I, which I, is I prefer which, not is, to. which is an yeah. interesting I mean it's an interesting way of, yeah. of flipping it to us and making us defend the, the, maybe it's the result of defending a rights perspective is that people want to take you to the extreme and make you defend it yeah. but it's weird you that, but you would never do this like again it was like it was like okay you believe in b banning some consensual sexual relationships and then the person comes on TV and you say and you say uh, you know banning uh, making out in a car on lover's lane defend that you know and making them defend Defend something extreme, although that might have been actually illegal at some point. But nevertheless, well, uh, this, this goes to there's an interesting um, unidirectionality to radicalism. Um, so Grant has has effectively defined radicalism as the more ra the, there's a there's a baseline, there's the status quo, and the further you are from it, the more radical you are. But 
the way that radical gets used here and the way that radical gets used in Washington, it's only really something that gets applied if you move in one direction away from the status quo. So if you are advocating the state not doing things that it's currently doing, doing fewer things, um, ultimately if you're an anarchist doing nothing, then that's the spectrum that you're a radical. But if you're on the other side of it and you – like in the, the banning making out in cars, if you are – just as far from the status quo, but you're instead advocating the state do a whole lot more. What you might you would say, like, well, no, you got the the economics wrong, or you have, you know, you you haven't this cause you haven't figured out. But we don't say like, well, that's just kind of silly radicalism to yeah. think that we should have single payer health care. Um, even you're though an that's insane monster, to just think as that. far yeah. from the status quo as saying we should have, you know, markets. In healthcare, only one gets, and I think I think that's because there's this. It still is just in the in the Washington culture, and I think this is true even in the. I mean, just in the broader culture, um, that it, there's something. It's just to to be opposed to the state doing things is simply uncouth. You know, it's the same as that that really silly thing you see from journalists all the time, where they'll say like, "This was the least productive Congress." in you know, 10 years because they didn't pass very many laws. Like the way that we measure the productivity of a government is simply by the number of laws it puts on the books. Not yeah. the quality and, of the and laws the, and or the whatever. way we measure the greatness of presidents is by how many people they kill. Yeah, how many wars they fought. But I'm on the radical yeah. point too. I think I think it's important to point out when that when you do use a robust robust conception of natural rights, going back to this question about radicalism, you can be ahead of the curve, and I always put this out very, you know, especially gay marriage, and especially marijuana legalization and drug legalization. That stuff was crazy, and and for those libertarians who, you know, believe that we have to concede to the popular opinion of the middle, and and not advocate anything too extreme, if that's the actual position. Although I'm not sure that's the actual position. I think the actual position is that they think some things are more important rights than other things. But if it's if it's all about rhetoric, we say so. In 1985, you we shouldn't have been talking about legalizing marijuana because we look like the crazy people on the block uh, who were advocating something that was totally insane, and therefore people weren't going to listen to us. And now, of course, we have it. We, it's a pretty popular position. Same with gay marriage. And one of the big virtues of that is, you know, when it, when you're advocating a natural rights conception of something like consensual sexual relationships, is that we never needed to have the discovery of a gay gene or the proof that the homosexuality doesn't cause social harm. These kind of things where people say, we want to legalize homosexuality because we have a study that says it's not harmful to raise children for gay couples or we want to legalize because we found a gay gene. We didn't need a gay gene to say, no, it's it's not definitionally a crime because of a theory of natural rights. If, it, if you have to find a gay gene to protect consensual sexual activity, then there better be a BDSM gene um, or, or for them to protect their activities. No, that's not how you think about it. It's consensual activity. And is that radical? Absolutely. In 1973, which was when the American Psychological Association took homosexuality off of being a mental illness. Right. We've been uh, sort of ragging on this idea that radicalism is bad. And I, I sort of want to be clear that there is a sense in which that's true, like there's a kernel of truth, which is that being uh, abrasive and extreme for its own sake is probably a bad thing. There's a, there's a 1978 uh, essay by Michael Cloud called The Late Great Libertarian Macho Flash, and it's sort of a memoir. Is of this it, on libertarianism.org? It is not, but maybe it should be. Uh, it's uh, – it's sort of a, a memoir of his experiences tabling, right? Which is a thing that you that you used to do. You still back, do that, yeah. yeah. Still I, do I, that. I did it in undergrad, uh, but uh, it's less 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 prevalent now than maybe hanging out on Facebook all the time. But basically, he he would observe, and you know, he included himself in this. People uh, delighting in offending the sensibilities of people less radical than them, right? Where someone would say, come up to them and rather than you know, that, ask some policy question, you know? And it wouldn't even be something like unfair, like you think toddlers should have tanks, right? <laughs> Which sure, why not? <laughs> uh, recreational nukes for all. Uh, but 
It would be like it would be something like, oh, you think uh, we shouldn't have Social Security, right? Like and, tanks, and, by the way, are probably far safer in the hands of toddlers than in adults. Yeah, because the toddler's not going to be able to do much with it, whereas the adult well, has the ability that's, that's and the remember. malice. Speaking of toddlers with tanks, Donald Trump does have tanks currently, so yeah. And nukes. And nukes. Whether whether or not they're recreational is uh, up in the air. Yes. Uh, right, but they would ask even these like reasonable questions about you know what about Social Security, right? And then they would come out like guns blazing, like you want to enslave me by you know taking my hours of labor through the income tax and right and the, just the extreme posturing is right and and that sort of thing is is entirely self serving, right? There's there's no there's no attempt there being made at persuasion. There's no attempt to say, here's here's the, the best case I can come up with for, you know, why it's true, you know, in a in a level headed temperate way that, you know, we shouldn't have Social Security. Right. It's 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 done because it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like I'm this cool outsider who's like better than everyone. Right. So I think I mean I think that to the core idea here that we keep coming back to then is um, and it's it applies to this natural rights discussion, but it's much broader than that, is that there's a difference between that principle and rhetoric are not the same thing. Um, and that changing rhetoric or saying that the rhetorical style you're using is not effective, is not good, is caustic, is whatever else, is driving people away, is not itself a critique of your underlying moral principles. Right. Well, and I think that it's also saying like it's not just about rhetoric, right? It's 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 saying that like, look, th this principle is not conducive to winning. Therefore, we should abandon it. As though winning is the goal and not the principle, right? This is this is one of the thing that, things that drive me insane uh, about the the whole Trump thing, right? Where people are saying, look, you know, the Libertarian Party is never going to win. Uh, Rand Paul is never going to win. Uh, take whatever, you know. So, what libertarians should do is. You know, find someone who is going to win and support that person, which that that's that's insane. Which is exactly to me. the, I mean, if there's an ideology to the Trump voters, it's it's that it's like that. The only thing that matters is winning in this weirdly defined. You know, I mean, I think that the for a lot of Trump voters, let's the core base, it's that you know, winning is simply making the people we disagree with mad. Like that's it, and so as long as we're making them mad, whatever it is, like there's no, it's it's a it's winning divorced from principle, right. entirely. Um, right. Because the, the whole reason you want to win is because you have this principle. Because you, you want to enact important. the principle or, right. or move in the right direction. Towards right. So it. so if we're if we're then talking about oh uh, you know libertarians who genuinely think that the welfare state is unconscionable, right, should stop thinking that because it won't win, right. That's like. I don't care, <laughs> right? Well, yeah, but that's not the, yeah. that's not the point so much. I think yeah. that the really interesting thing that we've hit on in this conversation, which I mean, I think it's sort of implicit in a lot of the writings that are. I mean, really, it's been a debate in libertarianism for a long time before it was recently a debate on the website. But that there are some people who think that some rights are more important than other rights, or they should be moderated in certain ways. So the question about and and. I might be one of these people. Like free speech rights, uh, you know, consensual sexual activity. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what else is listed in your essay here. Um, different types of, of freedom of association, political involvement, things like this. Be pretty absolutist on those things. But then when it comes to something like, you know, we're going to take 10 percent of your income to help people out who are poor. It's like that's yes, and, they, and that's okay. Uh, or that's less offensive to me because I think that these economic rights, these rights of property are less absolute than I would argue that free speech rights are, for example. Now, it's, the hard part would be justifying that because a lot of things that are criticized about absolute rights, as you point out your essay, you say the absolute rights don't solve all these questions. What about when you have certain dangers or things that don't come up? Well, free speech has all these problems too. Um, and, and you say we have freedom and we have security and you say, okay, well, what about uh, trading secrets or what about uh, giving aid and comfort to the enemy. Uh, what about passing out draft dodging literature in World War One? We still have to make these decisions, or we can just be absolutists and say yes. And you can also yell fire in a crowded theater. Right. Uh, 
So there's a, there's a few things going on here, some of which are sort of technical, and I may just spout out some citations and then, and then leave it at that. Uh, so rights thinking is uh, – there's uh, – I think it's Nozick who says rights are trumps, right? The idea is if I have a rights claim and you have something that is not a rights claim, my claim wins, right? So if I, if I own this styrofoam cup, which I'm brand, you know, brandishing in the air, and you do not own it, but you want it for some reason, like maybe, uh, you know, I need that styrofoam cup to live or something. Like, what? I don't know what your story is, but uh, if if I have a right of ownership over the cup, that trumps your claim, right? So there's this question of, okay, can rights conflict, right? Uh, and that's a subject of some debate in in the the literature on rights. Uh, there's sort of a few ways you can go, right? If you have uh, a situation where there's multiple sort of types of right, uh, then maybe you're running into these balancing issues. Uh, on the other hand, if there's sort of like one overarching thing uh, and then everything else uh, sort of follows from that, right, or as an instance of, uh, then then sort of from the beginning you're set up not to have these conflicts. So if I, if I describe my right to free speech, as a ownership right, an ownership of my body, an ownership o over this uh, paper and this pen, an ownership over a printing press, right, an ownership over a movie theater, right. Now there's now there's no longer a question of uh, can my right to speech conflict with your right to some other thing, right? Because it's all we're all we're talking in the same terms, right? And that's sort of the tack Rothbard takes. Uh, the stuff to read on this about. Uh, the compossibility is is the word that is used right uh, in the literature of the compossibility of rights. Can can two rights exist at the same time without conflicting? Are they possible together? Com possible. And uh, I well, just, Hillel Steiner's essay on rights is that what you're going to say? Well, that's that. I was going to start there. Right there's that, that uh, book is is very expensive and almost impossible to find. I believe you, that we can put a link up to. Tom Palmer's kind of summation of it. Yeah, well, so I was thinking specifically there's an essay in that book, I think, called The Structure of a Set of Compossible Rights. It could be. It's just very yeah. – I've, I've been looking for that book recently. Okay. And uh, it's yeah. like $600. Well, okay. So well, we'll if, you're, if, you're, you if, you're a college, if you're a college student with uh, access to JSTOR, you can you can get it through there, which is how I, I got my copy of the essay. Uh, the, the other one is uh, Alan Gaworth, The Basis and Content of Human Rights. And then uh, Cato's own uh, Roger Pallon ordering rights consistently. And Roger's project in that in that work is he he was studying under Goworth and he took Goworth's framework and said like you're almost there, but the answer you're looking for is libertarian conception of of rights and how they work. And I think he argues it fairly compellingly. I wanted to just make a quick point about radicalism. Um, so this could be rights radicalism. Um, it could be libertarian radicalism. Um, it needn't be libertarian anarchist radicalism. But anything where you're you're pushing you're sufficiently far from the status quo to be radical. I think that the rejection, one of the problems with the rejection of that on its face of just saying, well, you shouldn't be a radical. Um, which underlies a lot of the critiques of the kind of natural rights radicalism that Grant that you write about um, is that it's – to some extent, it's ahistorical um, that you go back and you look at the history of political progress, um, that the changes that made the world a significantly better, freer, happier place, they're not coming from people who wanted to tinker around the middle. Um, they may, I mean, they may have been enacted in some cases by that, but they're driven by radicals, by people who were thinking way ahead of their time, by people who were making forceful arguments. Um, you you read these texts, and they're the texts that today resonate with us. Where you can you read them, and you can say like this person, you know, maybe they're not ultimately as radical as I am, but these people were really onto something, had incredibly important stuff to say, and their ideas changed the world, um, and. And I, you never say, well, I wish they had just tamped it down a bit. I wish that they hadn't advocated so much radical stuff. 
Um, I wish that they had stuck more to tinkering around the margins. You say instead, no, I wish if anything that they had been louder and that more people had listened to them and that their radicalism had spread faster and further than it had. And so I think that if we if we see radicalism now as, you know, like the art of the impossible, you know, like why bother with it? We're only going to tinker around the edges. That's that's ahistorical in the sense that it's like this is not it there is absolutely no reason to believe, none to believe now that we have reached the pinnacle of government institutions, that we've reached the pinnacle of human achievement, that we've reached the pinnacle of human freedom, that the world as it is now is the best that we can get. I, that would be that would be as absurd as thinking that science today has figured everything out and there will be no more progress. Um, and so if we if we reject the very idea of radicalism, we reject the people who are making these large claims, we will never we, we will halt progress. And so maybe the radicals are wrong. Maybe some of them are wrong or maybe some of them are right. But in retrospect, future generations will look back on us if we embrace that path and say, boy, I wish those people had been a little more radical. On that point, Aaron, there's this, uh, this tendency that we, we see sometimes with libertarians to think that the, the, the liberal tradition, the classical liberal tradition, like starts with John Locke and ends with Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, and that ever since then we've just sort of been coasting, right? And that we we reached the the full implications of the Enlightenment uh, revolution in thinking about man's place uh, in the political order. But there are thinkers in the liberal tradition, like Murray Rothbard, like Lysander Spooner, uh, who have sort of carried the torch forward. And I think it's important. Uh, that people engage with those thinkers and be challenged by them and argue with them and uh, sort of look towards the horizon rather than back towards the past. Thanks for listening. This episode of Free Thoughts was produced by Tess Terrible and Evan Banks. To learn more, visit us at www.libertarianism.org.